I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is two back or not to back. And I think we have a longer one ahead of us today. Uh, this, as usual, is a Kickstarter roundup, crowdfunding roundup. We do have at least two or just two game found campaigns to go over as well. We'll be covering all of that. Uh, but starting off the bat, starting off the bat with, uh, as usual these days, we have Cult of the Now. Uh, because I'm going to be going over all these crowdfunding campaigns and because many of these crowdfunding campaigns are going to run you very, very much money. That's the correct technical term, very, very much money. Uh, Cult of the Now is to remind you that there are great games available now. Rather than spending a hundred plus dollars on a campaign that may or may not, you know, show up in the next year, that might show up two years from now, that may or may not be the game you're hoping it would, that may or may not be cheaper in retail, Cult of the Now is a reminder that there's plenty of ways to spend money, which maybe isn't the message I'm trying to send, but plenty of ways to spend money on games that are available now, that are well-rated, that are available for a relatively affordable price, especially in contrast with these other games. And today's Cult of the Now is Kemet Blood and Sand. $72 from Cool Stuff Inc. As usual, not sponsored. I just like to go over all the various game stores, uh, but $72 for from Cool Stuff Inc. for Kemet Blood and Sand, a fantastic game that's gotten a reprint. Uh, the reprint's not without its issues, but it is my preferred version of Kemet versus Kemet Blood and Sand. This game has been well vetted, well loved for a very long time, and is absolutely amazing, considering that this, a well loved top 100, I'm 99% sure it's top 100, a game from Board Game Geek is, is available for $72 in contrast with some of the things we're going to see today. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of amazing games out there that you should be looking at if you haven't already started. And from there, starting off with Board Game Adjacent. As usual, we're going to be going through this. We're going to start with Board Game Adjacent. We're going to move to cancellations and not funding, then to updates, we have two this week, and then finally to the new campaigns. As usual, every single thing is timestamped down below so you can check those out at your leisure. But starting off with Amora Book 1, The Stranger and the Statue, this is coming to you from IV Labs. Uh, IV Labs, if you're like, isn't that suspiciously similar to IV Games? The answer is correct. It is suspiciously similar to IV Games, which is also suspiciously similar to IV Studios uh, because they're all the same company. IV Studios has their own uh, marketing or whatever that they do. I I'm less actually aware of all that stuff because I'm focusing more on the IV games. But then they did IV games where they had Moonrakers, they've had uh, Veiled Fate, and then my personal favorite from those, they've had Mythic Mischief, and they have a whole little game company as well. And now they're branching off into uh, the way they put it is employee initiated projects. The idea that hey, let everyone do their thing. It doesn't have to be board games, but if people want to create, if people want to be inspired, if people want to do things, they want to give them the platform to do so, and hence Ivy Labs. And Ivy Labs is starting off with the book about Amora, a young girl named Amora with mysterious powers and destined by myth to be taken and never seen again, which is very tragic when you think about it. The idea that you are destined by myth to be gone forever. I don't know what that means. I actually have the comic. They just sent it to me. I, I just got it yesterday. I haven't had a chance to dive into it yet, so I can't comment on it. That being said, even if I could comment on it, uh, comics are not something I'm an expert in by any means. I could either give you a binary that was enjoyable or not, and maybe I'll do so, just probably not within the next four days, unfortunately. But 373 backers, $8,849. This will likely fund. Yes, it's close, but it will likely cross that finish line before the campaign ends, and this is one of their employees. It's one of the people at Ivy Lab trying to branch into, you know, creative freedoms and, and comics and all those fun things. Uh, in general, these things I don't talk about with Board Game Adjacent, I don't talk about hold its value or not because I know nothing about that market. This is ultimately just me letting you know that there is a game here, in, not a game, habit, force of habit. There is a comic here in case you are interested in diving into this, uh, in, case you're, in case you're interested in seeing a bit more about the story, watching some of the videos, seeing if this pulls you in. And from there, we move to another Board Game Adjacent, which is Unique Jigsaw Puzzles. 2,100 backers, 130 $37,000 raised. This is not the first time we're covering uh, puzzles on the channel, and usually I do it when there's a bit of a extra thrown in, and in the case of this, there is a bit of extra thrown in. Uh, this is going to be one of those puzzles where the bo the box you're given is not necessarily the full be-all and end-all. There's going to be a puzzle with, you know, high-quality pieces, all that. I do high-quality in, in quotes because I don't know anything about puzzle quality, so I'm not well uh, equipped to say that, but they, they've they done all the other puzzles. They have a whole, like, little chart, chart of other puzzles are puzzles. Other puzzles are, are puzzles. I mean, listen, I'll, I'll go for it. I, right over here. Here we go. All the, all the things of other puzzles are puzzles, but the thing that's intriguing is the idea that the puzzles have a degree of differences from the art, a degree of mysteries to, to discover, of characters that you're going to be going through or following in different ways. So it's meant to be more of a interactive journey of a puzzle as opposed to just, here's a picture, go ahead and make it. Now, what I can say 
I can't speak for these puzzles from Escobate at all, but what I can say is I have definitely seen great puzzle quality, terrible puzzle quality. I've definitely played or put together puzzles that were absolutely amazing and a joy to do so, and I've put together puzzles that were an absolute nightmare and horrific to do so. Puzzles are not all created equal. It's not as simple as stamping a picture on a box and then sending it off. There's a lot more that goes into it, and uh, listen, if they follow that checklist, this one seems to be doing all the right things. Again, I can't actually comment until I actually had it in front of me, but uh, these are puzzles. If you're interested in puzzles, with a bit more than just a picture and a box then the jigsaw puzzles reinvented whatever it is and then they have a few smaller puzzles as well if you want those but they have a whole bunch of options you can go ahead and get them they did have an interesting little thing about pricing where it's like I, I can't remember there's a little thing about msrp but i'm not overly going to focus time on it but anyways that is uh the the combo tastic jigsaw puzzles all of that i need to start using the word combo tastic you stop using the word from there we move into cancellations that are not funding we have two cancellations and one not funding although the one not funding is an interesting one starting off with Cthulhu Thulu Island, which unfortunately canceled. Uh, this seems to be a bit of a pushback against, they, they launched and then they, like within a day or two, they canceled. It seems to be a bit of a pushback against the price point, as well as the way that they kind of separated out the solo mode. So we have the leader pledge without the solo mode for 79 euros, and we have the leader pledge by its own with 89 euros. I think that's more of a tactical issue. The idea that solo costs extra is something we do see in games. We do see, here's a game, and here's an extra solo mode with extra components, with extra this, with extra that, but often it has to be done a certain way, and I don't think it's a good look in Kickstarter campaign in general. I think it's a little harder to sell it when you're already selling a premium product, when you're already doing it at a premium price point. I think it's a little harder to bundle it up uh, the way they did. Uh, so a bit of a pushback against the price, a bit of pushback against the general campaign, the way it was being run initially or the way it's being presented initially. They're canceling, they're, they're, recou they're you know, re regrouping or whatever it is. They'll be back on Kickstarter at some point. This is the same company that have done uh, Seven Sins or Sins. I think it might be just be Sins, but whatever it is. But this is Cthulhu Island. We'll see more about it shortly at some point in the future, and we'll talk about it more then. From there, we have Meanwhile at the Con. This is another cancellation, another one that canceled in a few days. Meanwhile at the Con launched and just didn't see a, enough of a reception, enough of a, you know, following. They had 34 backers, $1,400 raised, and just not on track to be funding. Meanwhile at the Con is a, is a game about running things at the convention. It's about being at a convention. It's about trying to, you know, it's about the car drafting, tableau building as you build out your booths, your costumes, your this, your that, trying to manage all your, you know, your celebrities at the Con, just trying to manage the aspects or different things going on at at a convention. I think a big part that was a hard thing for them in this one is just the art in general. Uh, at the end of the day, and this is always personal opinion, but when you have 34 backers, I think that personal opinion was felt by a lot more. Uh, the art doesn't look fully fleshed out. The art very much looks prototype stage, and it just doesn't, it's not enough to fully compel you. A video that I've been meaning to do for a while that I really need to sit down and finally do is why art is so important in Kickstarters. Uh, some of you, your answer is like, well, of course, duh, but it's more than that, and we'll talk about it in a future video, but at the end of the day, people do buy with their eyes, especially on Kickstarter, more so than ever on Kickstarter, and I think you really have to be, like, you really have to give them something that makes people want to dive into it, and I don't think this did enough to do so. Thematically, this is an interesting theme. It's different than what you usually see. Uh, mechanically, seem to be checking a lot of solid boxes. I just don't think that the game screamed, hey, you must have this game, and in their update about the cancellation, they talked about that. They said, hey, we're going to be coming back to Kickstarter with new videos, new graphics, new deluxe components, clear information about the game, updated pricing. So they, they understand that they didn't, you know, give people enough of a reason from a variety of different options as far as jumping in, and they'll be back on Kickstarter, which is great because, again, the the, the theme itself is incredibly unique. So I, I think this will be a great game to actually do well and succeed. I just think they need a little more oomph behind it. Uh, from there, we move on to the not funding category, which is Bad Karmas and the Curse of the Zodiac. And this one's not funding at $186,000. This is the time where I both say congratulations on not canceling your campaign within two days and also really hoping that by the time you watch this video, it hasn't been canceled because that can happen. At the end of the day, I filmed these on Sunday. You're seeing this Monday, which means you might be looking at a cancellation and being, hey, Alex, that was super awkward. But what I mean by that is $186,000, 24 days to go. This absolutely will fund. There's not a question at all. But it is a regular occurrence on Kickstarter and crowdfunding in general where you set a funding goal and that really means that that's the floor that's the bare minimum that's what you want in day one and if you if you don't see that kind of success sometimes they cancel and relaunch at some point which wouldn't even be the craziest thing to do i would have no no hard feelings against uh Tebru or whatever it is against the name company in Tebru. i would have no bad feelings negative feelings against them if they chose to do that explore that's the name of the company so yeah if they choose to do that for a tactical reason if they choose to regroup to you know reshow that's fine i have no problems with that but as of right now as of right now, they have not cancelled, and more importantly, as of right now, it absolutely will fund. That's not a question. 709 backers, 24 days to go, $186,000. 
This is on track to hit the $300,000 number, which speaking between me and my friends, that's the number I peg this at because the bad karmas in the curse of the Zodiac is just practically speaking a very hard sell because what you're doing is you're selling a console and a game at the same time. They actually did so at a phenomenal price point considering that you're getting a console and a game at the same time. At the end of the day, I think that it is harder sell to sell someone on completely new technology. People have doubts and fears and wonders about how the technology will work. Will I have to constantly recharge my dice, my bases, my this? How accessible will the system be? Also, it's the first of the kind. Do I want to jump in and be part of the first of its kind? Do I want to be part of the beta testers, so to speak, for this application, for this game? And then you're factoring the fact that there's just a price point involved in a console and a board game. And I mean, a board games nowadays on Kickstarter is a board game that's a miniature heavy boss battling board game would already be $200. And then there's a console to boot. And so the fact that they managed to do that for $200 or less for all of that, although it does depend if you want all the expansion content and everything, that does mean that this does put itself in a bit of a position of being a hard sell, which is why I figured $300,000 was a reasonable price point, which both accounts for the fact that there's going to be a good group of people that want to jump in on this game, while being a lot of people that are like, hey, you know what, I'll wait for the next one. And the good news is there will be next one. So in case I didn't heavily go into it, because I didn't, uh, The Bad Karmas and the Curse of the Zodiac is a game, and the game is built on the Taboo system, the Taboo console. Taboo is, like I said just a second ago, it's a console. It's not actually a game. It's a framework that lets you play games on it with much more of a digital aspect. So when you pick up a miniature on the table and you move it over, the board recognizes that you moved it. When you roll the dice, the board recognizes that you roll the dice. The board is constantly telling you to readjust, to shift things. It is basically running the game for you, the, the, the most integrated hybrid of tabletop and digital that I've seen yet in any implementation. That's what we're getting over here. And they're already going to have more games coming. They're going to have the Vampire Masquerade, which from what I've heard from other people who've played it, it seems like a good implementation of using the technology to its benefits. And then they'll have Sword and Sorcery, which from my own opinion is a great use case because Sword and Sorcery was a very maintenance AI heavy game that was a great game and the idea of having the application, the system run everything for me would be phenomenal. Part of the problem here is we have the bad karmas and the curse of the Zodiac. We have a no-name game that no one ever heard of and it just you know seems like you're just running around rolling dice, which to some extent you are with caveats because this, the bad karmas, is a boss hunting experience. The idea of the bad karmas is you're basically trying to, you know, it's a boss battler. You have your characters, you have your cards, you have you upgrading your cards, you have your actions, and you're trying to juggle or manage or guess the boss's AI and how they act so that you can most ideally accommodate, react, adjust so that you ultimately win the game. Now, one thing you haven't seen yet, although you will see within a matter of days, is we just got to play against Gemini, the second boss that they gave out. Uh, most people who play the game have played against Ares. I, if you check, there's a gameplay over on Quacklope with me and Quacklope and a bunch of others against Ares. If you check Dice Tower, if you check Board Game Coffee, everyone who's had this game has played against Ares so far, and we have a gameplay of Gemini, which I sat down to play today, uh, coming out shortly. Short version is Gemini, I have complaints, you can check it out at the end of the video, but Gemini was even more promising than Ares, giving me even more of a consideration of the tactical aspects of learning and adjusting to a constantly moving board, to a boss that has its own rule set that you have no idea. Uh, Gemini was, again, I do have complaints, but overall was a significantly better and more engaging system than Ares, and a lot of fun, and we did get smashed in the head a whole bunch of times. Whether we won or not... That you'll have to watch and find out, but that will be coming shortly. But that's effectively what we have over here. We have the Bad Karmas, a boss battling, dice rolling system, and then we have the Taboo system all in one. As far as pledge levels, and by the way, I know this is significantly more detailed than I usually go into than compared to most things that aren't funding, but $180,000 not funding and due to fund shortly, I'll go into it more. But then we have 170 euro for the core pledge, although they did recently add a 100 euro Taboo Believer pledge for those who wanted the Taboo system, who wanted to get and on the ground floor, but without the game. People who believe in the system, but aren't interested in the bad karmas, which I totally get. I believe in the system more than I believe in the bad karmas. I like the bad karmas, to be clear, but I think Taboo as a system has more promise than the bad karmas, which is a good game, and Taboo is a unique and very different system. Anyways, so for those who want it, which currently at the time of this filming is 12 backers, although they did just add it, so uh, we might see that grow over the course of the campaign. Then we have 170 euro, which gives you the core pledge. That's the base Bad Karma's game and the Taboo system. And then at 290 euro, we have the Saga pledge, which gives you all the bosses. It's going to be another eight bosses you can fight against. And yes, you can pick and choose. You can go ahead and bundle up, you know, just the core pledge plus a boss pack. You can pick and choose your own options. But if you want the bundle over here, 290 euro for the Saga pledge, which is a lot of money. It's not a small 
amount of money, although factor in 100 euro is just going towards the console. Now, I'm not saying that to reassure you, it is a new technology. I don't know what the cost will be. I don't know what the longevity will be. I don't know how many issues or bugs there'll be. What I can say is there have been a fairly minimal amount of issues or barrier to entry as someone who's using the platform, even now in its beta, 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 beta stage. But I don't know if that gets better as a final product. Where I am right now, I have had minimal issues, but not no issues. And so the question is, how will a final product be? What will end up happening on the final game? There's lots of pros about the Taboo system that I make, I believe, make it a very interesting system that I'd love to see more of. But also, it's still technology. It still means you have to charge your dice. It still means you have to worry about the fact that can you sit down and play or will you set up for game night and you will have cross-platform connection issues and suddenly you have to pull a terrible game like Kemet Blood and Sand off the shelf instead. It's an excellent game. But you have these issues and these questions. So that's everything that's going on here. Whole lot of bosses, whole lot of terrain, whole lot of extras, whole lot of everything. I am excited to dive into the 12 bosses. I am intrigued to see how they keep them replayable. One of the biggest concerns I do currently have from playing the game is I think each boss is likely good for two to three plays before you start having it figured it out enough that you lose a little bit of the adventure of diving into it again. Uh, so far, I've played against Ares three times. I've played against the new Gemini just once, literally today, a few hours ago. Uh, but as far as diving into them again, I would love to play Gemini again, but I don't know how many times I'd love to play Gemini. How many times is it before it's interesting or not interesting? The good news is because this is a technology, it's always easy enough, or easy enough is probably the wrong term, but it's doable to put out patches for the gameplay or different things like that. So this is way too much time on this game. This is feeling like a full dedicated video on its own, but that is everything going on as far as this. Uh, I don't usually go into the will it hold its value, will it not on things not funding. In this case, I will touch upon it briefly. I have no idea. This is a something totally new. This is the Taboo system and the bad karmas and the curse of the zodiac. This is a technology as much as it is anything else. What I will say is at the Saga Pledge, you will get the Platinum Founder status, which means you will get 10% off on the on your next three games they launch, which if the price point here is anything to go by, that's a roughly $40 to $60 value. It depends on the all-ins. It depends on this. It depends on that. So a whole lot of questions around how much is that worth. But if I had to guess, I would say that's worth around $40 to $60, although that still depends on whether you're interested in them. That might feel like a commitment. If you have 10% off the next game, maybe you feel like you should get it when you wouldn't have otherwise gotten it. So it may end up costing you money. Factor that in. Uh, but yeah, will the will holds value, will it not, is a very strong question. I just don't know. This is something entirely new. We have never seen a full board game console until now. And so I just don't know. If I had to guess, I'd say there's a decent chance, especially if the platinum status can be passed on to others, especially if that can be. But it's still a guess. It's just way too much of a guess, way too new in what it's doing. And as you can see, 709 backers at the price point they have, that's a big commitment, but it's also not 5,000 backers like you'll see on some campaigns. So a bit of a toss up there. Moving on finally to updates and things, which we have two. Nothing particularly notable. We have Earth Under Siege Flashpoint uh, the relaunch. There's no major changes here. They just continue to unlock stretch goals and characters and miniatures and all these things across the course of the campaign. I covered this two weeks ago. You can check that video out. I'm just covering it now because there's two days left in the campaign. So if you wanted to jump in on this game, now is the time to do so. It's a fantastic game. I believe I'm playing it again this week, although... Hopefully you'll see it by the time it's done. We'll see. But uh, Earth in the Seas Flashpoint, it, it's a solid game. Lots of coverage out there. Really looking forward to the final thing in this one. And they just had updates and stretch goals and all these extra unlocks, which is why I'm briefly mentioning it now. There's more characters. There's more mi miniatures. There's more bosses. There's more, I don't actually know if there's more bosses. There's more enemies. There's more other things. Whole bunch of new stuff in the game. And they also have some updates in terms of uh, additional unlocks. So our optional buys, I should say. So there's a miniature pack, or I think. There's a, what is it? Here, let's find it. There's a terrain pack. That's the one I'm looking for. They have tokens. They have the what's in the box oh well, there's one thing i did want to show i want to show the game trays that's what i want to show so if we look at the mission pledge we look at the retail pledge here we go add-ons so we have acrylic dice always nice we have a token upgrade in terms of upgrading some of the basic tokens of more ai characters to miniatures we have these game trays campaign trays which i highly recommend with the caveat that i haven't used these themselves but the goal of these trays is to give you a way to track and keep track of your stuff game to game uh, this is something that i plan on picking up on the chance that i actually do play the campaign because i find the main one of the main things that's a, really a pain to track in campaigns is just trying to figure out how to properly store things so I can be like this character had this that character had this I've upgraded these two cards the idea of having it all in a campaign tray I think is phenomenal I do wish they gave people the option to have fewer player trays like in case you're using less but the truth is even if you're playing it with two players you might be double handing and using both characters so it's not a bad price point and I really want that as far as just the accessibility if I do dive into the campaign and then we have the 3d terrain set $30 for some extra 3d terrain it's a nice stuff it's quality of life but it also adds to the cost of the game 
game to the price point of a full other game. So fact that in, this goes back to the whole cult of the now, lots of cheaper games out there that are amazing, that are available now. I do think Earth Under Siege Flashpoint is great, but it's also like $140, $170 plus shipping, plus this, plus all these extras, and you could get Kemet Blood and Sand. So both things are true. I think this is a great game, but also it's not a small amount of money. And then from there, we move to Literati. Literati, again, four days to go, 5,000 backers. This has done tremendously well, which tends to be a hard thing to do for award games. Then in general, if you would have asked me how a Literati would have done, I would have thought 1,000 backers, maybe. Ward games in general are just a hard genre to kick on, well, Kickstarter. In general, people tend to be a little skeptical that they're actually good. The one that's broken the mold is paperback, hardback, paperback adventures. And even then, the first paperback really did struggle. It took them time to build up their name. Struggle is probably the wrong word, but didn't do amazingly well. So I'm very happy for them, uh, for Gap Closer, I believe it is. Gap Closer Games. I'm very happy that this one has done tremendously well because it's a great game. And I'm, I'm happy that people see the past, I guess, I mean, the, honestly, people are probably looking at the art as a starting baseline and it's pulling them in, but there is a great game behind the art as well. And from there, we move on to new campaigns. Starting off with Ward Explosion. Going back to what I said a second ago about how Ward games tend to not do well, Ward Explosion falls more into that category. Ward Explosion falls into the kind of hybrid of a genre of exploding kittens versus a Ward game. You're going to have your classic, you know, playing wards, abilities, cards, you know, tapping off on somebody else's ward. There's just a whole bunch of abilities and interactions that kind of merge the classic play cards, take actions, do what you need to do, versus also having a bit of spelling as well. There's some rules like follow a letter, spell a ward, do a different thing. There's all these small little rules as far as how the game plays but if you like ward games and if you like things like exploding kittens this tends to be leaning a bit or into that genre i will say these alphabet reminder cards I, I don't know if they serve another purpose, but if they're literally just there to remind you of the letters in the alphabet maybe this isn't the game for you although although if you're playing with kids i guess it's good to have it you know what comes after k l but like maybe they need that so fine i'll give them a pass i'll give them a pass because you might be playing it with kids but either way this is a word word explosion it's already funded it's gonna be like 20 dollars for the the base game over there then you can get a few other pledge levels get two copies things like that 277 backers eight eight thousand three hundred seventy five dollars raised practically speaking this isn't one that's going to hold this value if you get this game you're getting it because you want the game you want to support the publisher this is not one you're going to be able to get your 22 dollars plus shipping and handling back on but then we have malia lands of legends 2,600 backers, $359,000, 10 days to go. This is coming to you from La, La Botte de Jou. I think I'm saying that correctly. I'm never actually certain, uh, but they're famous for a bunch of games. They're, their most famous game is obviously It's a Wonderful World, and then It's a Wonderful Kingdom, but they also have Outlive, they have Netatanka, they have, um, what's that, Clash of Rage, they have uh, the Daimyo, they have a whole bunch of games under the belt. Uh, it's a Wonderful Kingdom is just the most popular, most famous, and though although Malia Lines of Legends seems to be giving it a run for its money, as far as hitting with possibly their next most popular game and Malia has a lot of things going on to it but the, the the best thing I could say or the fastest way I can give it to you is this is a Gloomhaven adjacent game that means it's not Gloomhaven although it has the price point of Gloomhaven coming at 140 euro for the game that's giving you all the miniatures all the content in a game that has everything it seems to have everything it has skill tests it has story it has an overarching world it has a changing world as you put down cards to adjust the map it has a dungeon crawling aspect to it it has rolling dice it has building your character it has story it has choose your own adventure it has uh what's the word they use they use um they use procedurally generated stories, although I don't think it's actually procedurally generated based on what procedurally generated actually is, but it's close enough. It's close enough in terms of the, the story that it's going to be giving you and everything else or the way it's going to give you all that. It has one-shot options in case you want to dive into things as a one-shot, which is always very appealing to me because I always am resistant to the fact that I will not play your 100 plus hours of story in this game. They're giving you, this is another one of those 100 plus hours of gameplay. I won't play it for 100 plus hours, or at least it's very unlikely that I will. And so like Earth Under Siege Flashpoint, I'm very happy that they're giving me a, a uh, what's it called, an accessible way to jump into it and build up and procedurally generate whatever story point or level I'm up to as you play through the game. There's a ton going on. You can find more by watching, uh, you can find out more by watching Manvis Meeple by watching, uh, I think Harbor Rhino had, Quackalopath, there's a whole bunch of content creators out there. Uh, the miniatures, by the way, I will say, the miniatures look fantastic. And I'm not just referring to the, um, on the page over here, I'm referring to the prototype miniatures you can see in videos, look fantastic, obviously that's still not you know your final renders that you might see in your production copy but having them on the table look that good is already a good start it's significantly better than having them on the screen look that good uh, but overall this one's very ambitious very ambitious offering you a lot of stuff now i will say if you go over to board game geek there's like you know a 9.5 rating from like 70 reviews or whatever it is although a lot of those reviews are people who have left only one review ever and that one review is a 10 for malia lines of legends 
I never love that. I never, I mean, listen, I, I, the game might be amazing, and I'm, I think it probably is good because there are enough high ratings in those reviews from people who've left 100 ratings. So there are enough people out there who clearly have dived into or tested it and rate a lot of games and don't just rate games well. So don't let my uh, little moment of, uh, you know, raining on the parade get to you. There are people who love this game who rate a lot of games. But I don't think it's a good look for a game when you click through a whole bunch of ratings and you see easily 20 30 people who have rated only one game ever and that game is Mario Lands of Legends because if you don't do your diligence if you don't look at all the other ratings it is then easy to dismiss all the other ratings from people who do rate all the other games it's may easy to sit there and wonder maybe the person who rated 100 games did rate those 100 games legitimately but Mario was the one that they did as a favor because they got offered whatever to like not offered I'm saying they got asked to leave a rating or whatever so I don't think it's a good look I think campaigns need to be mindful of doing that the 9.5 you get on board game geek that's great but people who look a little closer will likely like myself be a little bit iffy on on the numbers there but again that don't let that overly distract from the fact that i think this is a good game here i just i have, feel i have to say things when i see them for good or for, for better or for worse but that's everything mario lines, lines legends there's a few optional buys as well a few other you know dice sets or dice trays or other things you can get in the game there's a lot of game here and there's a lot more stuff you can look into a lot of videos you can watch to fully dive into whether this game is for you or isn't the short version is if you like gloomhaven style big box epic adventures this is probably worth looking further into versus if you don't you might want to consider why is this one different? What's it? And it is different to be clear, but why, if you don't like that genre, is this one going to be different? What is this one doing differently that's going to work for you? As far as should you back it, should you not, will it hold this value? These ones are tough in general. This is going to be similar to Earth Under Siege Flashpoint when I covered it two weeks ago. Same basic idea. When you have an expensive game offering you a lot of gameplay, being another Gloomhaven-esque adventure style game with uh, dice and dungeon crawling and all these other things going on and character progression and building and you have all this stuff going on in the game, there's always a question whether it hits that critical mass, whether it's one that's picked up. I would say given the publisher, given the butte de given the game where it is, I think there's a decent chance that like Earth Under Siege Flashpoint, I think there's a decent chance this one holds its value. Certainly not a guarantee. Not, it just isn't. At the end of the day, 140 euro plus shipping plus the extras, it's certainly not a guarantee this falls into the same category as Agamonia, as as Earth Under Siege, as Aridia. There's so many games. Aridia, I think, is more likely to hold its value. There's a that's a very ambitious, very unique game. But there's a lot of great games out there that the question is, can you convince enough people that it's worth that price point? And more importantly, can you convince them it's worth that price point when it's no longer on Kickstarter? Because people tend to open up their wallets a little bit more when it's on Kickstarter, myself included. Uh, it's a it's a flaw. We shouldn't. We do though. I don't know why. But anyways, that is everything. Malia, Malia. Uh, it's again. Good. It looks like a solid game. Price point wise, falls into the maybe category. It might hold its value. It might not. It's up to you to go ahead and back confidently or shy away confidently and pull Gloomhaven off the shelf or Kemet Blood and Sand. There, there's a reason I picked that game. Moving on to Tamashi Chronicle of Ascend. And yes, after much debate in all the comment sections, it seems that the general consensus is that it is Tamashi, not Tama. There have been a lot of competing voices, mostly that most of them saying Tamashi, but that's fair because I'm just repeating what other people have told me and the internet. If you Google Tamashi, lots of things say Tama. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fair. Why would you? In a video, I said Tamashi, possibly pronounced Tama. Got a lot of pushback on that one, but either way, Either way, from Awaken Realms Light, 539,000 euro. This one is doing phenomenally well, which I am sure Awaken Realms is sighing a giant sigh of relief. C caveat disclaimer uh, in general, I have done paid content with uh, Tamashi with... I have done paid content with GameFound, which is associated with Awaken Realms and Awaken Realms Lite. And by paid content, I don't mean review content. I mean, I've done sponsorship videos. So I do have a relationship with GameFound, which is associated with Awaken Realms, which is associated with Awaken Realms Lite. Factor that into everything else I say here. But going back to what I was saying, Tamashi is doing phenomenally well, which I'm sure they are very happy about because their previous games in Awaken Realms Lite have all done okay. They have not in any way risen to the level of an Awaken Realms style game. And Tamashi seems like it's on the way to being in the level of an Awaken Realms style game game. With 15 days left, with 539,000 euro to go, euro so far, this one looks like it's creeping in slowly on the Great Wall. I don't know if it'll cross the Great Wall or not. I don't even know if the Great Wall is the bar for, like, an Awakened Realms game, but they're doing phenomenally well. Uh, this one is basically a story, progression, cooperative, and competitive programming style adventure narrative game. 
a whole lot of wards there and that makes sense. I've played this game and all those wards do line up with what this game is. Tamashi has a programming element to the game as you, let me see if I can scroll down and find things on the page here. Uh, it has a programming element to this game as you draw different tokens from a bag and you lay it onto your board over here and then you move these tokens around to accomplish a variety of object objectives. You'll have your basic programs which will help your stats in different ways. You'll have your cards, your custom cards that you'll have trying to do in your old programs there and you'll have locations on the game as well as uh, story card locations that all have their own unique programs you'll be going for. So the whole idea is trying to tactically now man maneuver or build out your bag in certain ways and then move your tokens in certain ways to accomplish your objectives and your programs in the most efficient way possible. Meanwhile, you're going through a series of story cards. You're going through a series of story cards with a bit of a choose your own adventure as far as how you progress. That choose your own adventure might be based on the things you do. It might be based on whether you succeed or fail. And those are all leading you down a bit of a narrative arc as you try to figure out what you're trying to do and how to win or possibly lose at the game. There's also going to be various robots or enemies that are engaging with you, although they're all abstracted through the use of cards. You will not have miniatures on the board who are attacking you. You'll have a card that represents this robot or this sentry or this whatever that's chasing you through the city. When you move, it moves just like that. And you're going to have to deal with those robots. You're going to have to deal with those sentinels and going using, again, your programs. Each robot has its own abilities or own programs you can activate against it to escape, to attack, to hack it, to do different things in the game. I'm giving you a very high level overview of this. There's a lot of content out there. Rado has a full run through and final thoughts. Uh, Quacklobe has a full gameplay. I have a full first impressions. First impressions because the game only gives you three scenarios and one of them is a tutorial scenario that's basically a write-off and not a good representation of what the game is. So I just haven't had enough chance to really fully dive into the amount of content that I think this game will have. But I do believe it has a lot of promise and I'm very intrigued by it. And even just going through this campaign page in preparation for this video, I was like, I want to sit down and play again. That's the biggest thing I could say for it. Looking at the game, again, remind me that I do want to sit down and play this game. That is the biggest, uh, yeah, the biggest thing I could say in for it is that I want to play it. But going back to it, Tabashi Chronicles of Ascend is going to be, well, we have a few pledge levels of here. We have the Cyber Pledge for 102 euro, and we have the Core Pledge for 66 euro for the game. Now, the main difference between those is do you want all your standees upgraded to miniatures? And before you say yes, because I know the answer is yes, I mean, the answer is yes for me too, understand that this is going to cost you an extra chunk of change, and more importantly, if you're like, hey, Alex, I need those miniatures because I need that extra level of immersion. I want my character to be a miniature on the board, and I want that character to really make me feel like I'm in the land of Tamashi Chronicle of Ascend. Well, before you say that, remember that the enemies hounding you are abstracted through cards, not even standees. You have cards representing the enemies that are chasing you down. So the level of immersion you have in the game is already going to be compromised because the enemies are abstracted. And consider that before you pay an extra $34 or $36, looks like 36, before you pay an extra 36 euros, I should say, uh, for a bunch of miniatures to heighten your level of immersion. Will it add to your immersion? Most likely, yes. Uh, Awakened Realms in general makes fantastic miniatures. But understand that there's still a compromise towards what this game is compared to what a full dungeon crawler is. This is not a dungeon crawler, this is more of an exploration game. So factor that in before you get those miniatures, although again, they do look nice. Now going to the Cyber Pledge, let's go ahead and click through to this so we can see some of those miniatures over here. If we can see this, uh, the miniatures expansion, the, the Mashi Edge Runners. So these are going to be some of the miniatures you get in the across the course of the game, plus of course any unlocked through the daily goal so far. whole bunch of excellent miniatures, although I will say there's this one miniature over here, this one. This one feels like I need to dip it in some cold water or hot water and straighten it out and then let it set. This one feels like it's bending over. I, I, I understand they're going for something here. I don't know if there's been comments uh, reflecting this feedback, but this feels like a bent miniature to the point that I might try to straighten it even if it's not actually bent. Just, just my own two cents on this one. The rest of them I think look fantastic. I think they all look great, which is nothing less than what I expect from Awakened Realms in general. As far as the daily reveals or daily the daily goals, we'll just go through them very quickly. But a whole bunch of options over here, just going through the brothers scenarios. We have scenarios, we have miniatures, we have characters, we have more miniatures, we have more characters, we have the, the plastic damage markers, uh, the regular tokens being upgraded to those, that's always a good thing. We have a more com command center and another tile, we have more enemies, that's always a good thing, more enemies, more enemies, each one's a stack of different enemies you can deal with, which just gives you more variability to your experience. We have the last journey scenario. We have the body card and standee. We have more more stuff over here. We have uh, more info coming, and that's where we're up to so far. And that's what you get for this game. That's what Tamashi is. Again, you can check out more content in the game, but it's basically a programming adventure, cooperative and competitive game of character progression and lots of other things going on in it. As far as should you back it, should you not? Will it hold its value? Short version is likely yes. This one, as much as it is an Awakened Realms light on the technical sense, seems to be much more leaning towards Awakened Realms on the 
non-light side of things, both in terms of the type of game it is, in terms of the audience it's attracting. I mean, factor in that Awakened Realms games, Awakened Realms light games, I don't think have ever crossed 100,000 euro. I could be wrong, but I don't think they ever have. And this is five times that, and it's likely going to hit a million euro by the time this is done or close to it. So this is very much leaning far more towards the Awakened Realms side of things as opposed to Awakened Realms light side of things. And that will likely factor into the aftermarket as well. That will likely factor into the general acceptance and aftermarket and demand for this game. Even the way they're bundling a game and then a separate miniatures pack, which is standard for Awakened Realms in general, as opposed to Awakened Realms Lite. So I think this one will hold its value overall, no differently than any Awakened Realms game in general has done so. Whether you get it without the miniatures, whether you get it with the miniatures, I think this one is a safe back overall. Moving on. To Micro, Micro Dojo Loyalty and Deceit. I almost said Micro Macro because I sat down and played that yesterday. It's a great game. Micro Dojo Loyalty and Deceit. $11,000, $611,000, 617 backers, 16 days to go. This is the expansion for Micro Dojo. Micro Dojo is a game that was on Kickstarter a while ago for £5 for the game. And £5, was it even with shipping? It might even be with shipping. I don't even remember. But it was basically giving you a tactical two player head to head maneuvering game uh, of just tactical strategy for £5 because of how small it is, because of everything is. And more than that, it delivered on time. It was like three months or four months, and then it delivered. And now we're back, or they're back, with Micro Dojo Loyalty and Deceit, giving you an expansion to the game, which I covered on the channel. You can check it out. And I think the expansion is all around good things to the game. To be clear, Micro Dojo is a game that I'm not the target audience for. It's a game offering you an accessible table space, but at the cost of accessibility, at the cost of premiumness. I like my games to look pretty, and this one's trying to focus on being accessible and literally fitting the entire game into a Ziploc bag on your shelf. But while I'm not the target audience for the game, I did enjoy it. I thought there's a solid game there, at least for the size and price point that you're getting, and I think the expansion is uh, almost not, essential is probably the wrong term, but all good things. It gives you more variability, it gives you a double layered board, it gives you more goals, it gives you more options, it gives you these two tracks on the outer side that you're trying to move up, it gives you specific factions, specific bonuses or buildings, it gives you more characters, it gives you more of everything, some things that are just good, other things that are great, probably is a strong word, but good things, they're all good things to the game, and that's what you're getting in Micro Dojo Loyalty and Deceit, although you can get either just that, which is just for five pounds, the loyalty and Deceit Envelope or Edition. Alternatively, you can also spend £15 in order to get this upgraded to the deluxe uh, triple layered game board as well as having a full box or more specifically two boxes for the game. If you wanted your Micro Dojo game to not be in a little plastic Ziploc baggie because you actually want to store it on the section of your shelf with all the small box games as opposed to the baggy games because I don't know about you but I don't have any baggy games. That's a lie. I have one baggy game which is Love Letter, uh, specifically a print and play version of Love Letter. Everything else I own is in a box and I would want this in a box and they're giving you a box so if you want that option I, I, ideally you still have a plastic bag in case you want to travel with it but you have that option but they're going to give you two boxes which honestly I think is a bit pushing it they went from having plastic bag to having two boxes in a slipcase sure but I would have just wanted one box but whatever but either way that is everything for Micro, Do Micro Dojo loyalty and deceit as far as will hold its value will it not short version is not really if you want the game you should go ahead and get it on Kickstarter it's the cheapest best way to get it but on the other hand it's unlikely to hold its value it's the nature of expensive of, of cheap games they just very rarely hold their value well on kickstarter it's just hard for them to do so you won't get your money back if you're selling this on the second hand market Moving on to Ryo Zen from Tabula Games. Ryo Zen with $122,000 raised, 1,800 backers, 1,800 backers, 18 days to go. Uh, Ryo Zen is their newest game. This is a worker placement uh, across three rounds in which you're trying to collect these moon shards and you're trying to place being mindful of the day phase and the night phase. Again, uh, there's a gameplay over on Quackalope. There's a review over on my channel if you want to check that out. But this is basically every single round you're placing your various workers. And one of the things you can do is you can upgrade your workers and get more customized workers. Every time you place your worker, you get the ability, although that depends because you might place your your worker face down to have more influence which is relevant to the night phase because when you place your worker you get an ability but doing the night phase whoever has the most influence in the region gets a different reward and so you want to factor that in as well and so you're trying to constantly balance all these different things where do you want to go do you want to go face up do you want to go face down which abilities are you going to take which workers are you going to place how are you going to focus on getting the most ideal set collection of moon shards across the course of three rounds as you build out the regions as you might be as you're mindful of the various events as you gather these extra scoring cards a lot of fun little things happening in under an hour. Uh, the best thing I could say for Ryozen is this 45 to 90 minutes, we didn't come close to 90 minutes when we played this game. We, every single game we played this was under an hour, giving giving you a solid amount of game for the a solid amount of decision space and crunchiness for the game time that it gives you. Uh, as far as my, I guess my one of my bigger complaints, I didn't actually even say this in my review, but I thought of it more after, I just think the board somehow looks a little bland. I wish the board popped a bit more. All the colors look a bit muted. I wish it popped 
a bit more. The characters look great. The tiles and the characters look great, but when you take all that off the board, the board just really sits there and does not stand out. Small little nitpick. But either way, uh, as far as the game itself, so that's basically I covered the game. I covered the, let's cover the pledge levels. 39 euros for the essential edition of the game that's going to come with all unlocked ordinary stretch goals. The relevance of that, if we scroll down over here to the essential edition, is you'll see over here the essential edition is going to be, well, this over here for 39 euro. And then for 69 euro, an additional 30 euro, you're going to get the free sleeve, you're going to get the stretch goals, deluxe and regular. You're going to get the solo expansion mode. You see this is another opportunity where you're paying extra for solo, but it's kind of done differently in a way that makes more sense. Instead of saying the solo edition is costing extra 10, they give you the deluxe edition with all the extras of which solo is included. There's always ways you have to play the game to not be offensive. Uh, three pounds for three euros for the pl plastic organizers and 24 euros for the deluxe components. Going through what you get over there, as we go through this, whenever you see that little plus over there, additional mode. So you have an additional mode that's unlocked over here that's going to be part of your basic essential edition. The plus two, the plus four, all these things are things that were unlocked in these stretch goals. More characters, more tiles, more revelation cards. All these things are extras that are unlocked for all people who ever pledge level essential or deluxe. The deluxe edition, on the other hand, has more stuff. All those things you've already seen, those unlocks you can see them again it's just showing you very clearly separating the page the various areas and what you're getting extra but now we have custom shaped tokens we have custom shaped tokens we have the realistic resources all these extras you're getting although for an extra 30 euro you're paying nearly twice the price of the game but you're getting a bunch of extras do you care about those extras do you want the solo mode are you going to play it solo you these are all questions you'll have to ask yourself as far as deciding which plus level is for you and it's even possible that going for the base pledge level plus some extras might be the thing that makes more sense for you even if you don't get the solo mode and the realistic trades if you don't find yourself using those so factor all that in although the realistic resources coming in at 24 euro on their own kind of push you towards the deluxe once you want the real once you want the realistic resources but that is everything going on with ryzen as far as should you back it, should you not. A short version of this one is uh, their games. Tableau's games have fall always fallen into an interesting middle ground in the sense that many of their games tend to be it depends on the secondhand market. If you back these games and they're not for you and you want to sell it and get your money back, uh, for some of them, people have done well. Others, people haven't. And more specifically, even within the same game, if you pick any one of uh, their games, let's say, um, what's the one? Bar the, the Barbarians of the Invasion. Barbarians the Invasion. If you pick that one and you look at the secondhand market for Barbarians of the Invasion, there are many people who got what they paid and more back for their pledge. And then there's many people who got like half what they paid for the pledge. The secondary market is all over the place on some of their games, which makes it very hard to accurately predict. The The answer is it depends. As far as if you want the game, what should you do? Should you back it? Should you not? Well, they tend to have a very low retail presence, and that's going to be even further magnified if you want the deluxe edition. If you want those extras and the exclusives, of which there are extras and exclusives, then what are you going to do? Your options are secondhand market where you can take a risk. You might get it cheaper. You might not. Or your options are just basically not getting those stuff at all. So it's not cheap. 69 euro. This goes back to the whole chemical blood and sand. 69 euro for a game. I and mean, that's a lot for a game. That's a lot. And then shipping as well. The biggest problem you're going to have is shipping's going to come in at roughly 20 euro for the game as well. Once you scroll down and find it somewhere over here. And that's really going to put a dent in your ability to get your money back or not. So if you want the game, this might be your best chance to get it. But it's one that you are unlikely to get your money back, especially when you factor in the shipping on its own. If you're looking at the, the core pledge alone, just the price of the base pledge, then you might. But the com combined with the 20 euro shipping, I believe that's included, to be fair, so I think that part's fine. But combined with the shipping price, I just think this is one that you're less likely to see your money back on, which means if you back this, back it because you want it without the expectation that you're going to get your money back. You might, but I think it's a harder sell that you will. Moving on to Habitat's Nine Lives and Basket Boss. 1,200 backers, $93,000, 18 days to go. Board game tables, once again, putting together a trifecta of games and once again putting together a trifecta of mostly reprints mostly you know redone retweaked redeluxified versions of games and to that end we have habitats which is habitats we have basket boss which is basket boss and then we have nine lives which i think is their own game i think i could be wrong about this one but habitats and basket boss are both definitely reprints of existing games habitats is being an original 7.3 on board game geek basket boss being a 6.5 on board game geek those things are relevant because a reprint is often a reprint and it doesn't mean the game got better although to be fair to board game tables they very often do do small tweaks as well as graphical tweaks they do majorly and so it is likely to be marginally better i mean a good reference point is always atlantis rising which the original game has 
like a 6.9 on Boarding Geek, and the new one has like an 8.1. Graphical tweaks and rehauls and slight adjustments can result in a better game, but still walk in skeptical, especially if you're going to be spending the $124 that you're going to be paying for the all-in. That's for all-in, for extras, for whatever, but still, a lot of money, so you just make sure you really want these games. Uh, additionally, you're going to get the upgrades for these games, which for Habitats is a whole bunch of meeples, and then for the trick-taking game, we have a few cats, and then for Basketball, we have a few trophies, so definitely some upgrades. I think some probably matter more than others, but that's a decision you'll have to make as far as what you actually get over here. As far as Habitats, Habitats is actually re-implemented by Nova Luna, which is a game that I think is excellent, and which was re-implemented by Sagani, which is a game that I think is excellent, and so while I've never played Habitats, I'm definitely interested in Habitats. Habitats is a game where you're building out your safari, you're moving your jeep around, you're going to be placing tiles down, each tile scores based on other things around it, so you're constantly trying to build out a thing where everything feeds off each other. This tile wants to be next to those tiles, those tiles want to be next to these tiles. Can you mix and match your situation in such a way that you have the best optimization of tile scoring? I love that in Sagani, I love it in Nova Luna. Do I have room for three in my collection? I don't know, but I'm sure I'll find out because, well, it's board game tables in general, and I like their games, or I like most of the games. Not all the games, but I do like most of the games. Then we have Basket Boss. Basket Boss is going to be the one from the trio here that I am the least interested in, which we'll get to in a second. But Basket Boss is basically you trying to recruit a variety of characters where you can see how well they're going to do across six seasons, and you're trying to manage them, you're trying to manage your team, you're trying to get other leaders or benefits or coaches or whatever it is to give you different perks, and trying to score as much as possible as you manage all these different things, and as you auction off the various people, and you try to figure out how you can, how much are you willing to pay for that player for the next six seasons or whatever it is, and you're trying to manage the economy of what you're doing and the, the the reward to your team personally, which might vary because you're also going to get points or perks for having different uh, different types of people on your team. So things that are worth something to one person might be worth more or less to you, and that will factor in your auction. And then finally, we have Nine Lives, which is a trick-taking game, which Ghost of Christmas, which was the game that I was looking forward to the least from the last Kickstarter, is actually my favorite game from the last Kickstarter. But we have Nine Lives, and Nine Lives is basically a trick-taking game where, first of all, you always know the suits in other players' hands because you can see it on the back, the color is going to be there. So I may not not know which numbers you have, but I know which colors you have, so that's a factor that I have to consider. But also, whenever you win a trick, you will take back a single card. Combine that with a few other aspects, and that's what Nine Lives is doing. And Nine Lives was reviewed or covered by... I can't remember his name, but uh, something trick-taking. Rory's... Not Rory. Was it Rory? I don't remember. Let me see if I can find him over here. Find him somewhere down here. He is somewhere down here. Somewhere. He, he, he does trick-taking. It's an entire channel full of trick-taking games, and he seemed to like it a lot, which matters to me because he liked Ghost of Christmas, and I was like, I'm not going to get Ghost of Christmas, and I did get Ghost of Christmas, and I like Ghost of Christmas now. Where's his name? Taylor's Trick-Taking Table. That's what it is. And so those are the three games. Uh, those are everything going on with the three games. Now, like I said already, the last thing that I kickstarted was for Factory Funner, Bear Raid, and for uh, Ghost of Christmas. From those three games, Factory Funner was the main reason I was getting that ga that campaign, and the other two were kind of uh, Bear Raid. I looked good, seemed like a fun game, and Ghost of Christmas seemed like a game that I would not like. Turns out Ghost of Christmas is my favorite from the series. Uh, Bear Raid is excellent, and I'm holding on to that one for at least right now, and Factory Funner is the only one I'm actually debating getting rid of, even though it's the only reason I'm backing it. To that end, Habitats, to me, is the main... That's not true. Nine Lives, to me, is the main one that I'm paying attention to on this campaign, and the main reason I'm interested here. Habitats is one that I'm definitely interested in because I love Nova Luna and Sagani, and Basket Boss I'm completely writing off, but I'll get because board game tables have surprised me in the past, and I wonder if they will in the future. The one thing I will say as far as these upgrades here is I really hope that all these meeples for habitats either fits in the box or has its own dedicated box because I do not want to be managing a separate bag of meeples. I say that because board game tables is excellent, except their boxes are tiny, which is great for shelf space, but it's terrible for cramming in the various Kickstarter extras they give you. Often you can do it, but it's often been close, and I'm a little worried about all those meeples where they made a point of saying, these are only half the meeples you're getting. Great. Make sure I can fit them in the box or give me a box for them because I do not want them in a separate bag on the shelf. As far as should you back it, should you not, will it hold its value, all of that, a board game table tends to fall consistently in the same space. I will say this is one of their more expensive campaigns. Usually that's because they have like a big box, a middle box, a small box, but they, between the extras and the games over here and the price of the games, this is one of their more expensive campaigns. But generally their games tend to fall in the same zone which is if you are willing to be patient, and if you don't care about the extras, you likely can get these things cheaper at some point or another in some way. But usually their Kickstarters are priced fairly competitively. It usually falls in the category of, if you are not interested in these games, you shouldn't be backing on a Kickstarter to begin with, and that the price point is definitely not enough to make that much of a difference. But if you're interested in getting the games, usually I do recommend just getting them on the Kickstarter. The price point now versus the price point later, and the fact that they generally tend to be harder to find or track down later, especially if you want those Kickstarter extras that you get, 
get, especially if you want those where you can really only get it from their website. Uh, generally, I find that the Kickstarter is usually the best place to get the games. And some of them do hold the value. Some of them do, some of them don't. It does depend. Some of their smaller boxes have done worse as far as holding the value. There just hasn't been enough popular demand. So it does depend as far as the holding its value part. Those are more mixed. Sometimes they do because their games tend to be in between print runs a lot, especially the more popular ones. But it's a lot all over the place. I expect Habitats to hold its value just fine. Uh, Nine Lives and Basketball I am less certain on. But if you want those games, this is likely the best place to get them. So a little bit in the middle over there, uh, mo mo most strongly in Habitats, with the other two being less certain on. Moving on to Oak by Game Grewer. 40 minutes, minutes in, we have three more games, and then all the stuff coming up next week. This is taking a while. Then again, I spent like 10 minutes on uh, Bad Karmas and the Curse of the Zodiac, so what do you expect? This is usually the part where I look over desperately at my audio bars to make sure my mic's on, because if my mic was not on, we would have a problem. We would just have a problem. Oak by Game Brewer. Oak by Game Brewer over on GameFound. This is the second GameFound campaign, and Game Brewer in general seems to have moved over to GameFound. Maybe that's a permanent move. Maybe that's campaign by campaign. I don't know, but their campaigns seem to be doing well on GameFound, so I would expect to see more of them. Uh, Oak is going to be their newest game. It's going to be a game of worker placement and managing your hand and upgrading your workers and upgrading a tableau and being mindful of the various choices you make as far as where to send your workers, as far as how to progress along this. A lot of different small little things, brewing potions, getting artifacts, a whole bunch of small stuff in the game, although up Upgrading your workers does seem to be the most fun, not necessarily the best gameplay part, but I just like the idea of you're dressing up your meeples with these various perks, a little uh, tiny epic kind of style in terms of the way they've handled their meeples, although these look very thematic and nice. Uh, that's everything going on with Oak. I don't actually have a full grasp on the gameplay, unfortunately. Uh, this is the nature of just having too many game games to cover. I have the high level overview that I just gave you, all about the, the worker placement. You have your upgrade, you have your workers, you're going to be upgrading them, you're going to be sending them to the various locations, and you have all these different things you're trying to juggle. Uh, the actual intricacies pass that don't really know you'll have to watch some content around the game to get a fuller better picture of the game uh, over on GameFound, you have a few options you have the deluxe edition and you have the retail edition of the game that's standard for the way game brewer runs things and then if you're a game brewer subscriber you will be getting the best price over there we'll talk about that shortly uh, they cover over here what the differences between the two games are very clearly between the retail and the deluxe with an 85 dollar euro price 85 euro price versus 110 euro msrp and a 50 euro price versus a 60 euro msrp as usual if you're getting the retail edition definitely absolutely wait especially because they make a big point about saying hey if you want the game first if you want to back the game if you're back in this campaign because you want it first we don't make a guarantee you'll get it first. We'll try, but ultimately if something goes wrong, if there's delays, we're not going to hold up the entire retail production or launch of the game. So if you're getting it because you want it first, do not back this campaign. They say that very clearly. So if that's your primary incentive, do not get so. Do not, do not get so. Do not back it. Do not get it. Uh, if you're backing it because you want the deluxe edition of the game, then we have two things to cover. The first, before we go into the deluxe, is the fact that over on Stroganoff, their last game, they have had issues with the production quality. I believe that 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 is localized and exclusive to Stroganoff. Based on the things that they've talked about, based on the things, the, the, the comments about who's producing the game and all that, it seems to be a one-off kind of situation. In general, Game Brewer has had fantastic production quality. At the same time, I would not be doing my job if I didn't warn you that they have had a very big blip on their game and they have a lot of upset backers who paid a lot of money for the deluxe premium edition of the game and got something that they do not think is worth what they paid for it. So while that is likely going to be a one-off, especially for a company that runs four or five campaigns a year giving you exclusive deluxe editions of a game it would be a death blow for them to continue to repeat that mistake it would be a very quick situation where people stop backing their games because hey i'm paying a lot of money and not getting something good so I believe that it's in their own best interest to have that be a one-time mistake. And I do believe they have worked with people on refunds. I don't know the exact details. Feel free to look into that further yourself. I'm trying to warn you of this so you are walking in fully informed. So you can't say to me, hey, Alex, why didn't you talk about the whole situation? I did. I did just talk about the situation. Now you know what you're getting yourself into. Again, that said, I think you're fine. I think it's safe, but it's your money to risk. So factor that in. As far as the actual differences between the quality of the campaigns, between the quality of the, the, the two, the retail and the deluxe, we have the different box editions, we have the insert, again, this is standard for, for Game Brewer, we have the thicker cardboard, we have the double, we have the, the meeples with a little bit of a paint or artwork on them, we have the double layered boards, we have the more double layered matte varnish, all these things, some of them mean more to you than others, we have the upgraded tokens, those are always a big deal for any game that I like, I always like the upgraded tokens, we have the bag with silkscreen print, I happen to never care about that myself, but maybe you do, we have 
have the custom shaped wooden pieces, the silk screen print on these upgraded tokens over here, the custom shaped wooden piece. Uh, we have all these fun little druid, druid upgrades that go on top of your meeples. That's going to be in both versions of the game. That's not game found exclusive though. And then from here, we can just see regular components that you're just going to see over here. Regular is just not bad. Just, you know, there's no difference between the retail and the deluxe at this point for all of these components. Uh, price point wise is 85 euro and the retail edition is 50 euro. A short version on game found campaign, on game brewer campaigns in general is their campaigns tend to fall in the category of you can back it, you can get the deluxe edition of the game. If you want the deluxe edition, game found is your best opportunity or guaranteed to get it. But also as far as holding its value, they tend to be a uh, drop in a little bit of the value. Meaning if you're paying 85 euro for this game, you might turn around and sell it for 75 euro and lose that 10 euro and lose shipping. Or you might be able to get your full amount of money back too. It does fall into that middle zone, uh, similar to what were we talking about, similar to Riles in as well. But I think it holds its value a little better than Tabula games, but still one that is not a complete absolute hold its value unless, unless you are a game brewer subscriber, in which case you'll be getting a cheaper price point on things. And at that point, it becomes a much better deal. You obviously have to pay to be a subscriber, but if you're backing multiple campaigns a year, it often makes sense to do so. You are limited to one copy, so it's not like you can buy a whole bunch of them and sell them. But if this is a game for that's not for you and you pay the subscriber price point, you are more likely to get your money back even once you factor in shipping. Again, they tend to fall in the category of mostly holding the value while not a hundred percent holding the value. And that is Oak, which brings us to Undici, I, Undi, Induchi, Undici, I believe I'm saying that correctly. I could be wrong. Uh, UND1C1 is meant to be the, uh, the 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 equivalent of the word 11 in Italian and pronounced accordingly, which means I may or may not have said it correctly. I practiced before the video, but that was an hour ago, so I've forgotten, unfortunately. You see, this is the problem with pronouncing things. Sometimes you have to actually remember the pronunciation for an hour, which I don't speak Italian, so that wasn't a guarantee that would happen. I was very proud of myself, by the way. I watched the video, I prepped, I was like, people are going to be like, Alex can't say half the words in the English language, but this he gets correct. Turns out, maybe I did and maybe I didn't. 1,100 backers, $106,000 raised, 24 days to go. This campaign is doing very, very well. Oh, it's over here. You see? You see? You can see. You see? How do you pronounce it? You see, I looked it up. I looked it up and I forgot to switch to the tab back, but I forgot anyway, so it didn't really matter. Uh, but this is a soccer game made by soccer enthusiasts, enthusiasts who wanted a game that really mimics soccer and does a great job and, and really feels ideal. And the video, to their credit, looks phenomenal or looks great. Phenomenal is probably a bit strong. Uh, the video looks great. Video seems to do a lot of it, seems to really sell you on the fact there's a lot of tactical strategy here. You're gonna have your unique teams, you're gonna have your unique decks, you're gonna be rolling dice. The part where the video lost me a bit is when somebody rolled a die and everyone cheered. If the point at which you're cheering in the game is when you roll a die, that to me says it's more about the luck than the tactical strategic play. Although I'm probably reading too much into a marketing video that's meant to just be fun. But as far as that, uh, as far as the game itself, I don't know what the background of the people who made the game are. The problem whenever you have one of these games, whenever you have a fan-made content, a game about bicyclists from somebody who loves bicycling, a game about climbing for someone who loves climbing. The question is, are they someone who likes board games the way, same way I like board games and soccer and they want a soccer board game? Or do they like games like Risk and Monopoly and, and Stratego and soccer and they wanted to make a soccer board game? And there's nothing against that. It's not about gatekeeping. It's just about knowing whether I am the target audience for the game. And I don't know. They do have a video from Mark Street from the Dice Tower. So they definitely do lean a little bit in the board game space, but that might be the research. I just, I just don't know their background. I don't know what they'd like or don't like. I don't know how the game is going to play or whether it's going to be a great game. And with Mark Street being like one of the few people who did cover it that I know personally, that I know like the type of content they make, uh, it makes it harder for me to know if this is a game for me, just where it lies, just practically speaking. That said, they clearly have done phenomenally well for a first time campaign to get a hundred thousand dollars, 1100 back on a soccer game they clearly have built up an audience one way or another and it does seem like they've been in development for a while like i think they talked about talking about the game in 2007 then kind of dropping and forgetting about it for like seven years and then bringing it up recently like three years ago my math probably does not check out but the general timelines do and then deciding they really wanted to make this game and they they've done so they have a whole bunch of uh, stretch goals they have some teams unlocked they have a whole bunch of extra teams you can buy separately as well uh, once you go through to the add-ons and all that whole lot of options over here and the, the, the price points over here are 59 euro, and there are add-ons as well, but it's 59 euro for the coach spa pack, the starter pack, and then 109 euro for the derby pack, where you got two copies of the game. Uh, really, the main option otherwise, the main extras are going to come through just buying the extra teams in the game, uh, but that's basically the higher level overview of what's going on over here, and that is 16% off the retail price, save 10 euro. As you know, if you watch these videos, you're going to pay more in shipping than the savings on the retail price, which means if it follows typical MSRP stuff and shows up in stores, then you're not actually saving anything. 
That said, because this is like a first time creator, I don't know what pathway it'll follow. I don't know if it'll fall into showing up in retail. I don't know what the price point will be. I don't know what's going to happen as far as the final versus now. It's too hard to say when you have that much of a fan created uh, game without really having a clear direction of where this will go. I would say I'm not confident it will hold this value, but I'm also saying not saying it won't. Some of these sports games, especially when done well, have had narrower releases and yet been sought after on the second hand market when people are just trying to track down copies that are not that easy to get your hands on. So this one definitely falls into the, like many I've said today, falls into the category of it's a risk, but if you want to back it, this is the safest time to get it, your hands on it in terms of just uh, guaranteeing yourself a spot, but it also may or may not hold this value. It may be cheaper on the secondhand market. It's just hard to say. With 24 days to go, there's probably going to be 2,000 backers by the time this thing is done, but I don't know who those backers are. I don't know if they're fat soccer fans. I don't know if they're board game fans. I don't know if from those 2,000 copies, there might be three that show up on the board game secondhand market. I just don't know. Moving on to the last game today, we have Boss Dog, the card game with Canine Criminals, Chaos, and Cannoli. 604 backers, $40,000, 20 phase, 24 days to go. I won't heavily go into this one because we are closing in on that hour mark and I really could use a sip of water. But as far as the game itself, Boss Dog is basically one of those classic play cards to do stuff games. It's a card the card game, similar to Exploding Kitten, similar to Doom Link, similar to any of these games where you play cards that get in each other's faces as much as possible and you're relying heavily on the theme and the light gameplay to appeal to people. You're going to have cards that cancel cards, you're going to have cards that steal dogs, you're going to have cards where you try to gather the food to place your dogs down. You're going to have cards where you play garbage foods in order to get in the other's way. So it's got like that take that card play style that uh, frankly speaking is a dime a dozen. There's a lot of games that do this. Some of them actually pick up some degree of critical acclaim. Critical acclaim is probably a bit strong, but they, some of them find their audience. Others don't. Uh, it's the nature of the, the way things go with these games. Uh, this one definitely leaning into like the cute theme. That's a big part for these games to do well. They have to find their cute theme that really calls out to somebody. It's 600 backers, so they definitely have found some degree of following. I'm happy for them. It seems like a family created team. And similar to um, uh, you, uh, Undici, it's not about gatekeeping or it's not about whatever. This game may well have its target audience. The question is, I'm always mindful of the target audience I'm talking to at the same time. I think this is one that if you like that style of game, then great. This one falls into that category, that style. But if you're not into that just general take that card play, this is that general take that card play, which uh, for me has, ne has never really been a fit. I've enjoyed some of these games playing it with my children, but they're not games that I ever seek out myself even when i've enjoyed them i've enjoyed doomlings i've enjoyed what's the unicorn one from the exploding uh here to slay here to slay is my favorite one from them but that's still just playing cards and take that and all that i have fun with it but it's not the type of game i personally seek out as far as will it hold its value will it not short version is most of these don't with the rare exception of games that have enough of a following like exploding kittens if you got the all-in pledges or whatnot there are certainly exceptions but most of these generally don't hold their value if you want them go ahead and back and support the creators on kickstarter uh, but they don't tend to not do that well on the second and market and that is everything for today which means breathe that is everything for today, which means it's time to talk about the campaigns that are coming up next week. Uh, this is just a few things that I happen to be excited about. They're not everything. There's a whole lot of stuff, but we do have Jurassic Park, the legacy of Isla Nubar, which I'm very intrigued. March 22nd, this is going to be expensive, and I'm probably going to get it because I like legacy games, and I'm happy to sit down and play with my wife, but this is one where you really will want to consider a lot of other games that are significantly cheaper before you spend way too much money on Jurassic World, the legacy of Isla Nubar. And then we have three games I've actually played. We have Tidal Blades 2, Rise of the Unfolders, very excited about this one, have really enjoyed diving into it. We have Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition, which I don't have a Kickstarter link for, at least not yet, but hopefully I will at some point. Uh, but this is also launching this week, it's three expansions for Terraforming Mars. I particularly enjoyed the Crisis one, the other ones I enjoy, but I don't necessarily need them. They're, they're good, I like them, I want them. But Crisis is a game changer in a very literal sense, it makes the game cooperative. Very excited for that one, I have a uh, review over on the channel, you can check that out already. And then my personal favorite, I have Encyclopedia, a game from Hoyle, Holy games that I absolutely am loving this one and maybe it's just me I don't know like I mean this is one of those times where I'm gonna sit there and like Aquatica before it I'm gonna tell you how much I love the game again and again and again and like Aquatica before it it's well liked by people I mean to be fair everyone in my group has played it almost everyone in my group has played it has really enjoyed it so maybe it's not just me time will tell and that is that until next time I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co 
Thanks for being here. Oh, wait, Picks of the Week. Picks of the Week. Almost forgot. Almost forgot. Let's go back to the games. Back to the games. Picks of the Week. So, Picks of the Week are as follows. We have two Picks of the Week in general. We have one for my my game that I'm personally most interested in, and then one for the one that will hold its value the most. For the one that will hold its value the most, we have Tamashi. Uh, Tamashi for Chronicles of Ascend. This is easily the best one to hold its value as far as the one that you should be getting on GameFound if you're interested at all, because it will hold its value just fine down the road. For my personal interest pick, there were a few that were interesting. There's Malia, there's Tamashi. But ultimately, the one I'm settling on is Habitats, Nine Lives, and Basket Boss. While Basket Boss is the one I'm least interested in from those, Nine Lives and Habitats, Habitats, at the end of the day, board game tables have done a phenomenal job of repackaging games and putting them into a pretty accessible, solid games with literally two pages of rules. Every one of the games has like two pages of rules, which is fantastic. They are so easy to dive into. Just this week again, I played GPS. It's just easy to pull out and play. They're not the giant immersive games. I mean, comparing it to Tidal Blades, Terraforming Mars, or Encyclopedia, they're they're not the same genre at all, but they are accessible, they are fun to dive into, and I find more and more, while I don't keep all the board game tables games I have, or I get, uh, I do find the ones that stick around tend to get a solid spot in my collection and are just fun to dive into. For a company that makes tables, they've done a great job with their board games so far. And now we can wrap up. With all that said, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Thank you for being here. I appreciate all of you sticking through to the hour and three minutes. Holy, have a good one. And yeah, reminder that if you want your unfair and unbalanced over on Patreon, I have a Patreon exclusive series where I go over all these Kickstarters and try to tell you all the reasons you shouldn't back any of them. It's specifically meant to be unfair and unbalanced. That's the nature of the series. It's meant to be aggressively counter FOMO to try to incentivize you to not back anything and hopefully save you money, although it will cost you $5 a month, but it'll save you more than that, hopefully. It saves me more than that, I can tell you that much. And also, speaking of Patreon, in the next few weeks, there'll be some sort of announcement Probably. Hopefully. I'm not ready for it yet, but something. Something. We'll see. Have a good one.